Hey everybody, welcome to another Sunday night at FBC Van. I'm so glad that you're joining us online as we continue studying through my very favorite book of the Bible, the book of Ezekiel. And I know that for most people, the book of Ezekiel, the, the word Ezekiel and favorite really don't go together. But every time that I read through the book of Ezekiel, God uses these words to comfort me, to encourage me, to convict me, and to motivate me uh, to, to follow him, to seek God's glory above all. And so I love this book. This is the second time I've had the privilege of preaching through it in my pastoral ministry. And I'm, I'm just excited every single time I get to do it because I get to read through and see the notes in my Bible that I had written and the different places I had highlighted that, that I had done before. And I get to see it again and, and see how I've grown or, or maybe the areas that I I still need some work on, and so it's it's just such a privilege for me to bring this this series and this study in the book of Ezekiel. So we've talked about so far, we've seen it in the book of Ezekiel, we've seen the character of Ezekiel. He was a young priest, about 30 years old, who lived in exile in Babylon. He was longing to go back to his home in Jerusalem, to go back to the land of Israel, but the people were going to live in exile in Babylon, as Jeremiah predicted, for 70 years. And so we see that God meets this young priest named Ezekiel. He gives him this incredible vision of the glory of God, and then he commissions him. He sends him to go out on a mission to reach the people of Israel among the, the exiles in Babylon to go and preach to them a message of judgment. They, they, they were in this land because of the sins that they had committed. And so he, he sends them out on this mission. Last week, we talked about this idea that God's glory was being attacked. The people had reached this level. They had kind of so embraced their idolatry that they were to this point where God had sent them away from his presence. And that's the key to understanding what we're going to study tonight. We're, this is part five of the series. We're going to call it God's glory departs. God's glory departs. We're going to be in Ezekiel chapters eight through 11. And I know that we're, we're not going to be able to cover every, every single verse. In fact, all I'm really going to focus in on and read tonight is just going to be chapter eight. So if you go there in your Bibles, I would, I would definitely appreciate that. We will walk through that. But that's the key to understanding this section is the presence of God. You see, the, the Gentile nations around Israel, they had temples, they had priests, they had religious laws, they had sacrifices, just like the people of Israel. But only the people of Israel had the glory and the presence of the true and living God in their midst. So when Moses had dedicated the tabernacle in the book of Exodus chapter 40, you see when he, he builds the tabernacle according to the Lord's specifications, and then you see... God's glory fall on that tabernacle and fills it up to the degree where nobody could even walk in that place. But then we see later on in the story that the, the sins of the people caused God's glory to depart from that tabernacle. And then again, later in the story in the book of 1 Kings, we see that Solomon, he dedicates the new temple. He builds and dedicates this beautiful new temple for the Lord. And once again, the glory of the Lord comes and it fills up the sanctuary in the temple but then now what we're going to see again is that centuries later, Ezekiel is going to witness God's glory again leave the temple because of the people's sins. Without the presence and the glory of the Lord, the people of Israel are just people. There's, there's, without God's defining, inhabiting presence among them, they're just another religious crowd going through the motions. In fact, Moses said to the Lord, if your presence does not go with us, then do not bring us. He said that in Exodus chapter 33, verse 15. The people of God are defined by the presence of God. So that being said, and, and everything we've kind of introduced before, let's read Ezekiel chapter 8. This is, to me, one of the, one of the hardest passages in the Bible to read. It, it should cause us to do some self-examination. This, this evening. So let's read. Actually, let's, let's pray before we read and, and kind of prepare our hearts for, for what we're about to see. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity I have to speak your word. Thank you for the book of Ezekiel that teaches us, challenges us, convicts us, convinces us, and encourages us. 
I thank you for your word, that it is life-giving, that it, it reveals who you are to us. Thank you, Father, for this time. We dedicate this study to you. May your name be glorified in this place. We love you, and we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so we're going to read Ezekiel chapter 8, and we're going to read, just go ahead, we're going to read the whole chapter. It's only 18 verses, but if you'll follow along with me, I would appreciate that. I'm, I'm reading, I usually preach out of the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB, and uh, it's, it's the, the one that our, our Southern Baptist Convention endorses. It's, it's Lifeway produces it. And um, so if you're ever wondering what, what version of the Bible I'm preaching out of, that's, that's that. But if you're reading out of the ESV or, or the New American Standard, you should be able to follow along. If you're reading one of the more dynamic translations like the NLT or the, the NIV, the New International Version, those might be a little different. Um, and, but you could still piece it together. It's all the same, the same meaning. But I, I would encourage, if you want to follow along closely with what I'm reading, that you pick up a copy of the CSB. So it says this in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 1. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, I was sitting in my house, and the elders of Judah were sitting in front of me. And there the hand of the Lord God came down on me. You know, something great is about to happen. Something spectacular is about to happen when the hand of God comes down on you. Verse 2, it says, I looked and there was someone who looked like a man. And from what seemed to be his waist down was fire. And from his waist up was something that looked bright like the gleam of amber. He stretched out what appeared to be a hand and took me by the hair of my head. Then the Spirit lifted me up between heaven and earth and carried me in visions of God to Jerusalem to the entrance of this, in the inner gate that faces north, where the offensive statue that provokes jealousy was located. I saw the glory of the God of Israel there, like the vision I had seen in the plain. All right, we're, pause for a second. Let's just kind of catch up with what we're seeing. God comes and, and, and grabs Ezekiel, literally grabs this prophet and takes him in a vision. Where does he take him? Back to Jerusalem. We're going to talk about this now the thing that we have to kind of decide in this because it's obvious he makes it clear he says um, this in in uh, verse three the spirit lifted me up between heaven and earth and carried me in visions so this is not a physical thing this is a spiritual thing God is giving him a vision of something that's happening but what I believe that this vision that he's giving him I believe that he's actually seeing what is really occurring. So he was actually able to supernaturally see something that's happening hundreds of miles away. But we're about what we're about to read, I believe that this is this is a true story. This is an actual literal thing that that uh, Ezekiel is seeing. So in verse 5, it says the Lord said to me, "Son of man, look toward the north." So I looked to the north, and there was an offensive statue north of the altar gate at the entrance. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they're doing here? More detestable acts than the house of Israel is, that the house of Israel is committing. So that I must depart from my sanctuary. You will see even more detestable acts. And then he brought me to the entrance of the court. And when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. And he said to me, son of man, dig through the wall. So I dug through the wall and discovered a doorway. And he said to me, go in and see the detestable, wicked acts that they are committing here. And I went in and looked. Now he's talking about he's in the temple at this point. He is in the sanctuary of God. I went in and looked and there was engraved all around the wall was every kind of abhorrent thing, crawling creatures and beasts, as well as all the idols of the house of Israel. Seventy elders from the house of Israel were standing before them with Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, standing among them. And each had a fire pan in his hand and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising up. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the darkness? Each at the shrine of his idol. For they're saying the Lord does not see us. The Lord has abandoned the land. And again, he said to me, you'll see even more detestable acts that they are committing. And he brought me, and this is verse 14, 
He brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the Lord's house, and I saw women sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was a, a, a mythological, he was, he was a, a god that, that the people worshipped. In verse 15, and he said to me, do you see this, son of man? You will see even more detestable acts than these. So he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, and there were about 25 men at the entrance of the Lord's temple, between the portico and the altar with their backs to the Lord's temple and their faces turned toward the east, they were bowing to the east in worship of the sun. And he said to me, do you see this, son of man? Is it not enough for the house of Judah to commit the detestable acts that they are doing here, that they must also fill the land with violence and repeatedly anger me, even putting the branch to their nose, or that kind of means kind of thumbing their nose up at the Lord. Therefore, I will respond with wrath. I will not show pity or spare them. Though they call loudly in my hearing, I will not listen to them. So that is chapter 8 of the book of Ezekiel. We're going to see some things tonight, but I really want to focus in on that chapter kind of as an as a indication or indicative of, of this whole section to chapter 11. But here in chapter 8, we see that Ezekiel receives a similar vision that he had received at the, at the beginning of the story in chapter 1, that, that he sees the glory of God, he sees the throne, he sees the man who, who is, is, is a, a foreshadowing of Christ. He sees Jesus himself with, with fire and lightning and, and, and authority. This is the same Jesus who's going to return and ransom and rescue his people in the book of Revelation. But he sees this vision, and this time it says that God yanks the prophet by his hair, okay? And so we know either this must be symbolic because we know that earlier in, in uh, chapter 5 that he had shaved his hair off with a sword, if you remember that. Or it means his hair had, had grown back, whatever that means. But uh, he carries him. God carries him in a vision to Jerusalem. Now listen, what should have been a glorious homecoming this should have been a heartwarming glimpse of the holy city. This should have been a time when Ezekiel says, I'm home. These are my people. This is the temple. This is where I belong. Instead, it becomes a scene of horror and disbelief as Ezekiel witnesses the extent of Jerusalem's idolatry. Can you imagine? This is, this is his heart's goal, his heart's cry, his desire. I want to go back to see my people. And then all of a sudden, when, he, when God gives him that vision and he sees what's happening in Jerusalem, he realizes, well, this is why we're in exile, because of what's happening there. God wanted Ezekiel to see this with his own eyes, the corruption and the sin that infected the land of Israel, so that Ezekiel would understand why God's glory had to leave. Sometimes God gives us a chance to look at our sin from his perspective, the way that he sees it. And then he enables us to confront it. He enables us to confront what kind of what we've been comfortable with, what we've been ignoring. So Ezekiel, he witnesses in this chapter that we read four different scenes of idolatry and wickedness in and, and around the temple complex. So we see the first thing uh, starting here in uh, verse 5. We see the people worshiping an offensive statue. So they had set up this idol and the people were bowing down and worshiping it. Then we see the 70 elders when, when he digs through the wall and kind of goes into the, the court of the temple and he sees 70 elders burning incense and worshiping images and idols inside the temple. Then we see, uh, starting in verse 14 there, the women weeping and worshiping Tammuz, who was a god, and they were outside the temple. And then the last thing we see in, in verse 16 is the people bowing and worshiping the sun. And at the entrance of the temple, they had turned their back on the temple. They had turned their back on the sanctuary of God, the altar of God, and they were worshiping the sun. So if you see kind of each of these locations represents something important, idolatry had infected the temple outside, around, inside, within, 
and beside, on all sides. There was idolatry in every location, inside and outside the temple. It was everywhere. It involved men and women. It involved leaders and priests, judges and magistrates. It involved uh, the common people and the royalty. It involved everybody. The whole of Israel's society was engrossed in the worship of idols. So God said to Ezekiel, he says this several times. He says, do you see this, son of man? Do you, do you see this? Do you get what's happening? Do you see the depth of the depravity of these people? He wanted Ezekiel to feel the weight of this, to experience the blistering heat of these people's sin and to recognize it for what it really was, rebellion against the glory of God. So we see the, the temple here in this section, the temple is defiled. Chapter 8 kind of details every part of it. God cannot stay there. And we're going to see that as we go on in the story. But God cannot stay in this place where they're worshiping idols. And they're weeping over idols. And they're, they're burning incense to idols. Now one, one kind of curious thing. It's just a passing statement here in chapter 8. But it's really, really unique when you dig into the story. Is We're going to talk about a, a person's family tree. It mentions here, there, if you go down uh, to verse 11 when he's inside the temple when he digs the little hole and goes into the temple it says 70 elders from the house of Israel were standing before them and then this is the thing with Jazaniah the son of Shaphan standing among them that that it, it seems strange that they would single out that one person that we have no idea who it is well on the surface because when you really see who this is it's 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 kind of a scary thing but Ezekiel recognizes him that that's Jazaniah that's that's one of the 70 elders of Israel so when he peers inside the temple he sees him so the the, the point of this though the reason why they singled him out his father Shaphan was somebody that we know in scripture his father Shaphan was the man who found the book of the law in the days of King Josiah so if you go all the way back to the book of 2 Chronicles, Josiah orders the cleaning and the restoration of the temple that had been neglected. And a man named Shaphan went in and he found the book of the law. They, had, they, were, they were going through the motions religiously. They, they didn't even have access to God's word in that moment. He finds it and then he, he brings it to King Josiah and it causes the whole kingdom to experience revival. He served the Lord faithfully, this man, Shaphan. Well, Shaphan had four sons. And we know each of them throughout the scripture. We actually get to see this family interact in, into these separate areas of scripture. But Shaphan had three other sons besides this man we see here. He had a son named Ahikam, who he was the one who protected Jeremiah from being killed. You can read about that in Jeremiah chapter 26. He had another son named Gemariah who had begged King Jehoiakim not to destroy Jeremiah's scroll. You can read about that in Jeremiah 36. And then he had another son named Elasa, or Elasa who delivered Jeremiah's scroll to the Jews in Babylon. You can read about that in Jeremiah 29. You know, our famous verse, we talked about it a little bit on Wednesday. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good. Well, that came from a scroll from Jeremiah to the people in exile. And, and one of Shaphan's sons was the one who delivered that. So there was this family, this incredible family family who was serving the Lord in all these different places and they connect all the different stories together. And in fact, Nebuchadnezzar had, a, had appointed Shaphan's grandson, Gedaliah, to serve as the governor of Jerusalem after, after it was kind of ransacked. He, he set him there. And you can read about that in Jeremiah 39. So this, this is a godly heritage we see here. This is a God-fearing and Lord-worshipping family. But then all of a sudden we see this fourth son takes a different path. We see him become an idolater. He's actually leading these 70 elders in worshiping idols. But you know what this goes to show you is that this, this level of corruption and sin that had infected Israel from top to bottom. It also shows you that inside a family, children can make their own choices. We can raise them to know the Lord, but ultimately they have to make the choice to serve him, to believe in him or not. So this is what happened in chapter 8. The temple is completely defiled. As we move on to chapter 9 and chapter 10, we're, he's going to see another vision. Ezekiel's going to see another vision. In the first part, the, the temple was defiled. The second part, we're going to see the people are doomed. 
So Ezekiel sees a vision of the wickedness of these people. He saw it in chapter 8. Now he sees another vision. And we'll just read the first few verses in chapter 9. Um, it says, Then he, uh, the Lord, called loudly in my hearing, Come near, executioners of the city, each of you with a destructive weapon in his hand. And I saw six men. He's talking about angels there. Uh, coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a war club in his hand. And there was another man among them, clothed in linen, carrying writing equipment. They came and stood beside the bronze altar. So what's going to happen here? The Lord calls these six angels, these six executioners, he calls them, to go throughout the city and just start destroying the people, destroying the idolatry, exterminating people because of their sin. They start at the temple, which was the kind of the the, the focus point of all the idolatry where, where the, the sin of the people was the greatest and then they're to go out from that. It says that the bodies of the slain would ceremonially defile the temple just as the people's sin had already defiled it. So we see this kind of destructive judgment come on the people and it's because of their own choices. It's because they worshiped idols. It's because they turned their backs, literally and spiritually, turned their backs on the Lord. But I, one thing I love as you read through this, I, I, I would really encourage you because we're, I, want, I want you to see in every passage of scripture to, to look for, how does this point me to the gospel? How does this point me to the truth of mercy in Jesus? Well, in the midst of all this violence and destruction, we do get another glimpse of the gospel. God commissions that, that last angel, that seventh angel, the one that was wearing linen, who had uh, writing instruments. He, he, he was a scribe, right? This, this angel. He, he tells him to go and to mark. He says in verse four, pass throughout the city of Jerusalem, uh, the Lord said to him, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the detestable practices committed in it. So he sends this man out, put a mark on the heads of the people who disagree with what's happening. Because he's, he's saying there are people who are not okay with this idolatry. There are still people who are serving me. There are people who are still worshiping the Lord. And so they need to be protected. So he goes through and he puts a mark on their forehead. So when the executioners, when the when the destruction comes through the city, those people will be spared. Again, this is, this is the gospel here in the book of Ezekiel. It's teaching us that God will spare a remnant, that he will pull people out of that fire, that he will save people from judgment. But the, the, the incredible thing as you dig down into this story is that the Hebrew word here for mark is the letter, just a single letter in the Hebrew alphabet called tau. It's, the, it's, it's, it's our modern equivalent of the letter T. And so the, the last, it's the also Ezekiel's time, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, um, which was written in Ezekiel's day like a cross. It's, this is incredible. So literally he was going around putting this mark, this towel, this cross on their foreheads in order to save them from destruction. This is such a perfect picture of the cross of Jesus Christ and how it saves us from destruction if we come to Jesus in faith. This shows us the mercy and the grace of God who, to spare those who seek him in repentance. So we see that the temple is defiled. We see the people are doomed. And then the last thing we see in chapter 11, if you go with me to chapter 11, the leaders are deceived. The leaders are deceived. I'll read a little bit. Um, here in, in chapter 11, starting in verse 1, it says, The Spirit then lifted me up and brought me to the eastern gate of the Lord's house, which faces east. And at the gate entrance, gate's entrance, there was 25 men. Among them I saw Jazaniah, son of Azur, another Jazaniah, and Pelatiah, son of Benaiah, leaders of the people. The Lord said to me, Son of man, these are the men who plot evil and give wicked advice to this city. They're saying, isn't it, isn't it time near to build houses? The city is the pot, we are the meat. Therefore, prophesy against them. Prophesy, son of man. And so we see this idea, ch chapter 11 kind of represents, he's going to get this, uh, this uh, reinforcement of his commission to preach against th these people. And so it represents what's going to become eventually the main thrust of Ezekiel's message. And it's not a message that I believe the prophet ever thought he would be sharing or desired to share among the people in this holy city. But he was commanded to speak words of death, destruction, devastation, and divine judgment. 
The leaders of Jerusalem, they had been leading the people with lies. They had been saying, God's not watching us. God's not here. He's abandoned us. We can do whatever we want. We can build our homes. We can worship our different gods. We can do whatever we want to do. They had been, they had been promising the people wealth and prosperity. But instead, God was going to deliver to them poverty and slavery because of their wickedness. So Ezekiel, he goes to his people and he delivers this message faithfully to the, to the exiles that he lives among in Babylon. And again, I want you to see, and I know that we've been moving through this really, really quickly, but we see the gospel again here in the pages of scripture. In, let's look at uh, chapter 11, let's start in verse 14. The word of the Lord came to me again. Son of man, your own relatives, those who have the right to redeem your property, along with the entire house of Israel, all of them are those to whom the residents of Jerusalem have said, you are far from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say, this is what the Lord God says. Though I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. So he's saying, I know that, that they had to leave their home. They had to leave the temple. They had to leave the sanctuary of the Lord. But he said, I've been the sanctuary for them. My presence has never left those people in exile. And it says in verse 17, Therefore say, this is what the Lord God says, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you from the countries where you've been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel. And when they arrive there, this is, this is fantastic. Read with me in verse 18. When they arrive there, they will remove all its abhorrent acts and detestable practices from it. I will give them integrity of heart and I will put a new spirit within them. I will remove their heart of stone from their bodies and give them a heart of flesh so that they will follow my statutes, keep my ordinances, and practice them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts pursue their desire for abhorrent acts and detestable practices, I'll bring their conduct down on their own heads. This is the declaration of the Lord. So we see the gospel here again presented. God promises Ezekiel, even though I am scattering my people, even though I am judging them, I will preserve a remnant. I will bring them back and things will change. I will give them a new heart. I will give them new desires. I will give them the, a new ability through my spirit to worship me in spirit and truth. I will give them the ability to be holy just as I am holy. He's going to take away their hardened hearts and give them soft and obedient hearts to serve him. He says the people will once again be in this place and they will serve me just as they did in the days of Moses in the days of Joshua. We see this fulfilled in Jesus. We see that when he came to deliver his people from the bondage of sin, when he gave his life for us on the cross, he enabled us to come to him in faith and have our old heart removed, our old heart of stone and disobedience and sin. And in its place, we, were, we are reborn. We are born from above. We, we are given a new heart to serve him and a new priorities, new power to serve the Lord where we are. He gives us all of this through Jesus by the work of the Holy Spirit. We're seeing glimpses here in Ezekiel of God's eternal plan that was going to happen hundreds of years later through Jesus. So in this section, chapters 8 through 11, Ezekiel, he again sees the glory of God. But what he sees is not his glory kind of among his people. But we read about this. Let's go back to chapter 9, verse 3. It says, then the glory of God. So he, he sees the, the visions of, uh, he sees the, the people of Israel worshiping idols in the temple. So in verse 3 of chapter 9, it says, the glory of God, of the God of Israel rose from above the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. Okay, so the glory of God here, it raises above the temple. It's no longer in the temple. It's, it's kind of hovering above. And then we see in chapter 10, verse 4, it says, then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherub to the threshold of the temple. The temple was filled with the cloud. The court was filled with the brightness of the Lord's glory. And then finally we see in chapter 18, so that it's kind of moving out of the temple. Then we see God's glory in verse 18 of chapter 10. It says, then the glory of the Lord moved away from the threshold of the temple. The cherubim lifted their wings and ascended from the earth right before my eyes. The wheels that were beside them, and the wheels were beside them as they went, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. And it stopped at the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house. 
And so then we see, finally, if we keep going, we're seeing kind of it move incrementally. The, the glory of the Lord, the cloud of the Lord's physical presence, it's moving a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further away. And then we see here in chapter 11, verse 22, then the cherubim with the wheels beside them lifted their wings and the glory of the Lord The glory of the God of Israel was above them. The glory of the Lord rose up from within the city and stopped on the mountain east of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to Chaldea, to the exiles, in a vision from the Spirit of God. So now we see the Spirit, the presence of God, the glory of the God of Israel has now left the city of Jerusalem completely. What they're going to learn in this time is that the presence of God among his people is a privilege, not a right. And so the takeaway from all of this, we're seeing God's glory depart from his people. The takeaway of all this for us today as believers, God's people are marked by his presence in their lives, but sin drives out fellowship with them. Now, that does not mean that if you're living in sin or there's a sin that you just can't seem to break free from, that God has left you. It just means that your fellowship with him is broken. And until you come to him and repent, turn your back on your sin and and, and ask for restoration, that's when God is going to come back. You cannot lose your salvation, but you can. This can affect your, your fellowship, your relationship with him. You're standing in holiness. If you believe in Jesus as your Savior and you have given him your sin and taken his righteousness, you're not going to lose your salvation. But we can drive out our fellowship, our our relationship, our companionship with him because of our sin. I think, honestly, this is where a lot of people are living right now. They they made a decision, but they're living so far away from him. And so Ezekiel is going to show us through this process that God is merciful. He's forgiving. His mercies are new every single morning. 1 John says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful to forgive you. So right now, whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're struggling with, whatever sins that, that you have that just, whatever sins that you just can't seem to break free from, give it to Jesus today. He will show you mercy. He'll forgive you. There's no reason to turn your back on him. Go to him right now in prayer and ask for forgiveness. That's what we're going to see. God's glory is departing from his people. But that does not need to be your story today. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for the promise of the gospel in the book of Ezekiel, that you will preserve a remnant, that you will save your people, that you forgive your people. You're a God of mercy and patience and forgiveness. Lord, I, 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 before you, I, I give you the things that have held me back from my relationship with you. I lay them down before you, Lord. I don't want anything to divide my focus. I don't want anything to to invade or infect my heart. I want to worship you with everything that I have. I want you to create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. I pray that you would, your presence would would be the the marking factor for us, that it would be what what designates us as, as your children, that you would be among us, that we wouldn't allow anything to come between us and you. Father, I love you and I thank you for the book of Ezekiel. I pray that it would uplift us and encourage us and remind us that you are holy. And you're calling us to live holy lives. We can't do it on our own, but we can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit inside us. That grows those, the, the fruit of the Spirit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. All these things, Lord, you grow in us. I pray that your, your presence would, would be among us today. Thank you for everybody watching. Bless them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, church, we've been walking through Ezekiel. We're now about a fourth of the way through, about 25% of the way through this book. We're going to keep marching through. And I'm so glad that you joined with us tonight. If you have any questions, comments, please don't hesitate to call the church office or, or uh, message us on Facebook or send me a text or give me a call. However it may be, I'd love to talk to you more. Remember, the takeaway for all this is that God's people are marked by God's presence, but that sin drives out fellowship with him. God bless. You guys have a fantastic week.